The first uh, speaker this morning is uh, Steve Wing, who is at the University of uh, North Carolina. Uh, he is going to be speaking specifically about the health impacts of radiation releases at nuclear facilities. Steve. Thank you, Andy, and thank you to the organizers of the conference. Uh, I think my title might be able to have been used by any of the speakers at this whole symposium. <clears throat> I wanted to pick something that I could fit into. Uh, but a little bit more specifically, I would like to talk about how we approach estimating health impacts of radiation releases from nuclear facilities. And there are two general approaches, which you've already heard about. I want to identify them and their logical bases and compare them. Uh, one approach is risk assessment. And that means that we use some estimates of dose and we multiply the estimates of dose to people by some dose response curve, which gives us the estimated number of effects, number of events, or cases of disease for each amount of dose. And the other method is epidemiology, which means that there's some kind of surveillance for disease. And we look at the differences in the rates of disease between exposed and unexposed populations. So I want to begin with um, talking about uh, risk estimation or projection. And this may be obvious, but I think it's worth noting or repeating something that, uh, that we all know is that randomized human experiments looking at the long-term consequences of exposure to various forms of ionizing radiation are not possible. So we, we can't conduct experiments. We can't conduct human experiments. So we have to either extrapolate from cellular or animal studies or conduct non-randomized human studies, which are uh, the epidemiologic studies. And both of these approaches suffer from problems of bias and uh, selection, measurement error and selection, which, of course, experiments also suffer from biases, but uh, I won't go into that today. So uh, just recently, this document came out from the World Health Organization. It's already been referred to most recently by Ian Fairley. And it is a risk assessment or risk estimation and it is based on the dose estimates produced in a previous report from last year on Fukushima. And it's also based on uh, data from the lifespan study of ABOM survivors, which you've heard about and you will hear about more in just a moment. Um, this Dose assessment, uh, I want to emphasize just a few of the things that Ian Fairley already has said, that there are a number of components of the dose that are ignored. The committee chose not to assess doses within 20 kilometers of Fukushima, of the, of the nuclear plant. Uh, they chose not to assess the radioactive gases such as xenon. And they did not assess fetal doses. Um, and I, th I think uh, Dr. Wardalecki has already given us a great introduction to why we might care very much about the fetal doses. Um, but what I want to start out with is talking about the lifespan study. And I'm going to show you a little bit of information that has been around for a long time from a uh, volume that came out in the 1970s, as well as some very recent information that has just appeared within the last 90 days from Radiation Effects Research Foundation and from our group at the University of North Carolina. Um, this 
These graphs show the immediate casualties uh, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in relation to distance from the hypocenters of the atomic explosions. And I want to make the point uh, that the study upon which all our risk estimates are based did not begin until more than five years after the bombings. And many people did not survive to be in the study. If mortality from the immediate effects of the bombings is related at all to frailty and to longer-term risk, there would have been a harvesting of the most sensitive, radiosensitive people from this population. I think that's a very important thing to remember, uh, especially because of the destruction of the physical infrastructure of these cities, uh, food supplies, water supplies, hospitals. Um, Hiroshima was hit by a typhoon. So there, there are lots of forces that are selecting, that we're selecting for healthier people. Uh, I also would note that the study of cancer incidents, which you've already heard about at this symposium, did not begin until 1958. So any estimates of cancers following exposure to radiation based on the lifespan study, cancer incidents, omit all cancers that occur within 13 years of exposure. And we know from many other studies that lots of cancers occur in less time than that. And this is something that is routinely omitted when risk estimates from the lifespan study are applied to other populations, including the population of Fukushima and the population of Japan. Um, it, and especially important in the shorter term effects are the impacts of in utero exposure uh, and also shorter, shorter latency cancers such as leukemia and lung cancer. Now, uh, a few other, um, a little bit more information from the 1970s volume on physical, medical, and social effects of the bombing. This is a depiction of the radiation from the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. Uh, we have the epicenter or hypocenter and the gamma neutron radiations coming from the blast, which were, were over, those radiations were gone within seconds. But there are other sources of radiation as depicted by the arrows coming from the ground below the blast, the gamma and beta induced radiation from neutron activation. And then uh, here in the Nishiyama district, in particular, radioactive fallout. Now, the Radiation Effects Research Foundation, which was responsible for the A-bomb studies, has chosen not to estimate any of the radiation doses due to these two um, other sources, residual radiation being composed of either induced radiation or uh, fallout. Uh, fallout was also a problem in Hiroshima. Uh, you can see in this map the drawings of where uh, the fallout, so-called black rain, uh, came in Hiroshima. And note that in both of these uh, depictions, the fallout is not right at the, primarily right at the hypocenter. Who's more affected here? People who live at some distance. So this is very important in an epidemiologic study because it means that um, the fallout is disproportionately affecting people with the lowest doses directly from the gamma and neutron of 
the blasts. What happened after the blasts? Who was near the ground zero? Uh, 